<clears throat> ah, what's up, guys? It is Rick Ginn, and today we are talking about how to convert your motivated sellers. We're going to actually talk about the specific campaigns, the specific words you need to use to work with them. But more importantly, I'm going to tell you the things that you cannot do so you don't get stuck in what I call unmotivated seller uh, H E W -L, L. So, uh, if you guys don't know me, my name is Rick Ginn, and I've been wholesaling for 20 plus years, and I absolutely love what I do. So, uh, one of the crazy few people that get an absolute rush doing wholesaling deals, actually any real estate deals, but I specifically love wholesaling. If you guys don't know what wholesaling is, go over to freewholesaling.com. We we as me and my son, uh, my son Zach, we teach a course 100% for free. And we teach it not only how to get your first deal, but how to make your first $100,000. And if you want to learn how to do that, go over to freewholesaling.com. Don't worry, I'll put it up on the bottom for you. But today we are talking all about how to convert your motivated sellers for wholesale real estate deals. And if you don't know what a motivated seller is, I'm here to tell you. So you have to find people that need to sell their house and you have to avoid the people that want to sell their house. And if you start from there, you can get an understanding of how wholesaling works. And what most people, they look for anybody selling a house and that winds up being the biggest challenge. So it's understanding that before we start out. So what I'm going to do is you guys have the live comments Use the live comments. We want to introduce yourself. And if you have a question, just go in there and ask the question. Hopefully it's wholesaling related and I'll answer that. And then if you guys want to go, let me put this on here. If you guys want to do the one-on-ones, what I want you to do is I'm going to put it in the comment section here. Um, let's see, one-on-ones. And there'll be a link in the comment section under Rick Yen. And let me just put it there. Boom. So if you guys want to do it with the one-on-ones, click the link, um, the comments at 509. And we do one-on-ones and there's no cost to it. So if you have a question, if you want to work on a deal, you guys know we do JV deals. This is the place to do it. Um, I put it under the comment. Look, look under Rick and it's pretty straightforward. So you have the comments. You guys can do the live. It's completely up to you. You don't have to show your face. You don't have to do anything with that. And that's what you want to do. So part of the teaching I want to do today is interactive. So if anybody wants to do a role play on how to convert a motivated seller, do me a favor in the private message. Hold on one second here. Sorry, there's somebody at the studio door. In the private chat message, just say, hey, Rick, I'd like to do a role play. And what I'd like to do is two or three role plays where I can actually work on how to convert sellers, uh, getting down to like the final negotiating part. Uh, but I want someone that willingly wants to do it. It is not a requirement. So if you're on the live right now, if you want to do it, put it in the private message. I, I don't want to like, I don't like the like, surprise people type of deal. So um, the link for the one-on-ones is in the comment section. That's about it. So let's let's jump onto it and let's talk about this. So I'm going to take about 30, 40 minutes and we're going to do the teaching portion of it and we'll go from there. Hold on one more sec. Come on in. It's a busy day at the office. So um, let me put it up here. So as I said, if you guys are new freewholesaling.com. Check it out there. It's got the full course in it. It's got 26 years experience in it. It's all in there. So, um, so the first thing you always have to understand is in wholesaling real estate, properties pick you, you don't pick the properties. Now, what do I mean by that is you don't just hop in a car and go, Hey, I just want to buy that house. That is what we call a retail sale. And if you do that, you will drive yourself nuts. They, it doesn't work that way. The properties pick you, you don't pick your properties. And the sooner you understand that, the easier this business gets. So knowing that is if we want the properties to pick us, 
you have to pick the right list. So everything you do when it comes to motivated sellers is always going to start with you being what we call a list ninja. And a list ninja is someone who spends a lot of time focusing on how to get the best list of motivated sellers. Now, I personally recommend getting government lists or go over to listrei.com or zachdata.com. It's the best place to get it. The government lists are 100% free. It doesn't require a, a subscription or anything. You will have to work to get some of them, but I love them. Code violations and probates probably being my two absolute favorites because I've been doing it for 21 plus years and I've never not gotten a deal from it. I've gone through droughts, but eventually I always get a deal off of them. So keep that in mind. Guys, if you have the right list, so a list is just a prospect of properties. I would love to tell you which one's going to sell to you. You have no idea who's going to sell to you on that list. So now you understand you have the list. The properties are going to pick you. You aren't going to pick the properties. And so, okay, how do I move forward understanding that? I've already talked about this earlier. Stop trying to convert retail sellers. Just give it up. It's a waste of time. I guarantee you are never, ever going to win them over and you're going to be stuck. So trying to convert retail sellers is an absolute nightmare. How do I know this? Because the first two years I spent every waking moment trying to do this and it never worked out. You see, these properties are the ones that need realtors and they need the market to tell them what the final price is because they're usually asking an unrealistic price and there's no money to be made on those deals. So one of the biggest keys is most of you that are struggling in wholesaling are trying to make deals work that have no business even being in your pipeline. So just because a property is for sale does not mean it's going to be a good deal. So if you know that up front, it's much easier to work on this. So what are signs that you're trying to make something work that's not going to work? If you spend too much time on the comp, more than 10 minutes, in my opinion, you're trying to make the numbers work because you're trying to buy the property, even though the data says it's not going to work. So unless you get a price reduction or renegotiate the whole contract, if you're spending hours on running comps and calling friends and posting stuff on the internet, you're probably trying to convert a retail deal and it's never going to work. Just save the energy. I'm telling you, you can spend 25 hours trying to convert them. You're never going to be able to convert them. I've never, ever converted one retail deal I've ever done. I've gotten deals off of it. I've made a few work, but for the most part, they're pretty much a nightmare and it's a waste of your time in the wholesaling space. So that's where you wind up in realtor world. And unless you want to be in that world, please stop trying to convert retail sellers. It's literally a waste of time. This is all you have to do. You ready for this? You just got to build rapport. And once you have rapport, that is the gate that goes down to have people open up to you. You still have to take the rapport saying, you know, I love your children's picture. I love that you fish. I love your old car collection. And you have to convert it to, to a conversation. Now, a conversation should be natural and flowing. You should not have a script for a conversation. A conversation means someone trusts you enough to have a conversation with you without feeling like they're vulnerable, they're going to be hurt or scared. Conversations are what you have with your friends and your family. If you can take that rapport skill and convert it to a conversation, you will get the best deal available, period. End of story. Is A script is so robotic. It's so fake. You can use the script as a guide, as a bullet point, but it cannot like be a deal that like closes people out. So once you understand this report and the conversations, you understand this. Stop selling. I know this sounds uh, like a complete opposite of what you're taught in the business. Wholesaling has nothing to do with selling. Nothing to do with selling. Guys, I was in a professional sales job for 12 years before this. I promise you. Wholesaling is not selling at all. It's the complete opposite. It's about connecting with people and finding people with problems that you can solve and create win-win situations. It's not people just looking to sell their house. If you want to get a listing for them, you have to go sell your butt off and compete with all the other realtors. I don't play in that game. So if we know we are going to convert deals by building rapport in the conversations. And you're telling me, Rick, I don't have to sell. I'm telling you in the 20 plus years I've done this, I've never sold somebody on a wholesale deal. Here's why. 
God gave you two ears and one mouth. If you understand how the two ears work and you listen to people extremely carefully, like you are completely dialed in, you can take in enough information for you to construct an offer that should be a win-win situation. That's it. Like the better you listen, the better your deal. But so many of you guys are trying to talk your way into the deal. And I'm telling you, you cannot talk your way into a wholesale deal. Either they qualify for it and you listen very carefully and you structure the right offer. Because when it comes down to it, you're not selling. All you're really doing is qualifying and you're doing exactly what you said you were going to do. And the only way you can do that is by listening very carefully. So many people love to talk, but very few people want to listen. Those that listen can take that information and actually construct an offer that will create a situation on what we call a win-win-win deal. And now, Rick, why are there three? The seller's always first. It's got to be a win for them. you got to be solving a problem and making them happy. Number two, it's got to be a good deal for you. you got to be making money because you're doing a lot of work. And number three, it's got to be good for your cash buyer, which is basically going to be your partner in the deal, so to speak. Because if you do an assignment, depends on where you are in this business. Your first deal, your hundredth deal, it's going to be different. But you have to always think win, win, win. And if it's not a win, win, win across the board, I promise you the deal will fall apart at some point at some time. Because if you don't have enough money in it for your cash buyer, they're never going to buy it from you. You're going to have to back out of the contract. If your seller wants too much, you're going to commit at a price that you can't follow through with and you're going to disappoint your seller. And if your seller sells it too cheap, meaning they didn't make any money and you made all the money, they're going to be resentful and they're probably not going to close at the closing table. So if you do not fulfill the win-win-win across all three spectrums, you're rarely going to do a wholesale deal. And so what happens is most wholesalers, like the seller agrees, you agree, but your cash buyer says, I can't because I can't make any money. Yet. That's not a wholesale deal. That means you didn't get the right price. It happens all the time, but I'm here to tell you, you must, you must learn how to qualify in wholesaling real estate. Qualifying, in my opinion, is more important than selling because if you walk people down the right path and let them know that you want to help them and work with them, that is really kind of your sales funnel, but it's not really selling. You see, when I'm selling a car, I'm telling you on why you want this car and why it's so beautiful and how it's going to make your life better. Think about when you're dealing with a seller with a problematic property. All you're trying to do is solve one problem for them to get rid of that property. And either they like you and they like what you're saying or they don't. You are never going to sell them into doing a deal. You're never going to force them to make you a deal, a deal and you are never going to win them alone on charm. And most people like that are, they feel vulnerable and they just want people to do what they say they're going to do. That's it. I'm telling you guys, is it like a huge secret? Now, I will tell you this. Uh, th this is the hard one. You're really going to have to suck down here because th this one, unfortunately, took me about seven years total to learn. Ready? You can't chase them. I go, wait a minute, Rick, I'm chasing my butt off to get these deals. I know, but you got to think about it. So any of you like went down the dating world. So I'm so far out of dating. I've been married 27 plus years, but even though when I was dating my wife and courting her, you have to, you want it, you're, you're overly interested in them and you're at home like, Oh God, please call me, please call me. But on the surface, you have to be like the coolest cat. Like, Okay, well, you know, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. And the problem is if you pursue anything too hard, people, assets, on um, perfect conditions, it, it freaks people out. So I'm confident if I overchased my wife over 30 years ago, she probably wouldn't be with me today. Because if you overchase people, like you freak them out and you scare them. Your sellers are no different. If a seller ever tells you, you seem very eager to buy this property, take note because it means you've gone over the line and you're freaking them out. I've had sellers tell me that too when I first started. I was so eager to buy stuff. I would like run over my own numbers. I'd run over my own like guidelines. And I'm here to tell you, think about the dog. I give you guys this analogy all the time. I let my dog out. I love the little critter. He drives me nuts. I let him outside in the backyard, we have a big backyard, and he takes off. 
and then he disappears. So I don't know if you guys have a dog like that, but late at night he disappears. He's all black. Okay. So it's dark. I can't find him anywhere. And then I see him a shade in the bush and I start to chase him. And every time I chase him, it's a game. And so if the dog's playing a game with me, every time I chase him, what do you think your sellers do? The more you chase, the more you're going to get your butt kicked. And here's what happens is it's just like if you're trying to like the data person, and you really like them. You got to be cool, calm, the charming individual, whoever you are, and you got to win them over. And even if they blow you off or they don't return your call the next day or they don't respond to a text, you have to be okay with it. So I always teach you about detachment. If you can do detachment, it works. It doesn't mean you don't care and it doesn't mean you don't want to be with that person or whatever it is. But the thing is, if you show it too emotionally, you freak people out. And that's what a lot of you guys do in wholesaling. I've been there. I did it. Like right now, I go in and make an offer. I let them know. I go, hey, listen, if it doesn't work out, I understand. I get it. And sometimes they'll go like this. Every now and then, if you do not know the answer to that, here's a little trick you can do. Mr. Seller, what are you going to do if I don't buy your property? It just starts. You can see if that is a test to see if they will chase you. Now, if a seller chases you, you should be concerned too, because sometimes that means there's something dreadfully wrong with the property and they're holding it back from you. So it does happen, but I'm here to tell you if they chase me too hard, I'm concerned too. So I recently had somebody chase me on a deal and found out the whole thing was fraudulent. And I, I kind of like, I knew there was something wrong with it. I just like, I wish it was that easy to make 150 grand, but they're trying to sell a property they don't own. And like we figured out in under underwriting, same thing. If you over chase and over pursue, people's intuition goes, why does he want the property so bad? Am I missing something? Am I giving it away too cheap? Like maybe I need to uh, ask for more. So you don't want to chase. That is going to be the key. So let me check here. Uh, awesome. We got lots of people here. Um, so anybody in the live, if somebody wants to do a role play with me and we're going to take two or three specific actions you can do to try to convert any motivated seller to get them to the promised land on the final negotiation of the price. Now, you don't have to do it. It's not a requirement. If nobody does it, I'll just give you the guy's answer, answer right away. But it's much easier if I interact with you guys and do it with you. It's not a requirement. Um, but just let me know in the comments. Um, actually, not in the comments. There is a private chat button if you are in the one-on-ones, if you want to put it in there, if not, we'll just, we'll talk about whatever you need. So, um, so what's up guys? Okay. So Greg says, Hey, Rick seller sent me his email for a purchase agreement. I need help with DocuSign. So we use DocuSign in our company. Um, I have no idea how to use it. I've never, ever used it. I have people that help me out with it. But um, if you want to do like a JV deal or something with us, go over to sellmypaper.com. You know, let me know. I would be happy to help you out with it. But like, I, I promise you there's somebody in this chat that can probably help you with a DocuSign. So if anybody can hook, um, I think, it, yeah, Greg up. Um, or Greg, if you want to add to this, um, I would be happy to help you out. So, um, sell my paper.com. If you guys want to do uh, JV deals, um, just kind of letting you know it is out there. And as I said, guys, uh, the whole selling course, I put it on the bottom for you and let me check here. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Angelo's got it. Okay. So if anybody wants to help Greg out with the DocuSign, I see people trying to help him out. That was awesome. That was, <laughs> uh, okay, I see. That's funny. You guys are funny. Okay, so let me check here. Okay, let's see who. Okay, I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. Cool. Like Jesus was the first oh, one. I'm the first one. <laughs> How you doing? So listen, it's not a requirement to do it. Do you do you want to you want to try yeah, the role yeah, play yeah, first, I, and then I'll yeah. answer any questions you got. And uh, the we'll, idea is to help you out, guys. I would rather you role play with me than like if you have a paid list or a customer like that because it's really nerve wracking. Then so 
Yeah. And Jesus, yeah. don't be nervous about it because everybody learns. I wish the God somebody did with this to me mm -hmm. um, when I was a lot, when I first got started. Nobody did. Yeah. Unfortunately, I spent a lot of customers like trying to figure this out. So here's what I want to talk about. Have, so have you done a deal yet, Jesus? No. Okay. Am I pronouncing your name correct? Yeah. Okay. Where are you located? I'm in Florida. Oh, really? What part? Yeah. Uh, I'm in uh, Martin County. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. You throw a rock at me, couldn't yeah. you? <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, I, I'm here because I, so. I have this uh, fishbowl in uh, Chobe. Okay. And it looks, the numbers look real good. And if and if I move it to like uh, bring it down, and uh, it, it looks like a real good uh, uh, assignment deal. Yeah. Okeechobee's an interesting place because it's yeah. got a mix of obviously residential. Oh, yeah, you yeah, have yeah. a lot of marine and agricultural. There's like, so everybody, every time I go out there, somebody wants to sell me 100 acres every time I go. I'm just like, because it, it's the, the problem with Okeechobee is trying to price everything out there because it's so unique and different. I bought some okay. wild stuff out there, but like oh, I also cool. own some wild stuff out there that I couldn't get. Oh, <laughs> um, anyways, um, so what got you interested in wholesaling? Uh, honestly, I fell for a guru trap. Uh -oh. I'm not even going to lie. Yeah. <laughs> Was it so, off of TikTok, YouTube? Don't give a name, but. Uh, YouTube. Okay. Yeah. How, how so, deep are you in the hole? I'm all the way, <laughs> all the way down. Just throw a number. How what would you spend on it? Yeah, okay. And yeah. no help, right? No. Nope. But uh yeah, I'm looking to make that back. Oh, and don't worry, crazy. I lost my first 5k and uh I've done very well since then. So sometimes right, right after I, unfortunately I, I, I don't want that to happen to anyone, but sometimes yeah. when you take a loss up front and you find out people don't deliver what they say, it, it is huge fuel for you. Mm -hmm. so but yeah uh, the good right thing after is I, i'm i'm doing this for free for you so he paid somebody else and i'm gonna teach jesus how to do this for free it's exactly so. and and it's crazy because right after i had joined i was looking up wholesaling on youtube and then i found you guys and, and it's like oh they do it for free yeah no yeah and like we do it for real like so you yeah, saw the other person's course of yeah. mine is it like night and day uh no, I don't I was, hide a damn thing in my course, guys. Like, I just tell you how it is. Nobody can believe me. Like, there's no way you can do it. I go, I already told all you guys, if, you want, if you're on this thing and you're thinking about buying a course, check out freewholesaling.com because you get to see everything under the hood before you spend a dime. And you, I'm still not going to ask you to spend uh -huh. a dime. Try that with any guru's course. I guarantee until your credit card swipes, and they processes it. You don't get to see a damn thing. And it's yeah. <laughs> it's all by design, guys. Like, why not give you a test ride for like seven days in the course? So I give you an unlimited test ride. So whatever, dude, dude just use it as fuel, dude. I got, just yeah. so everyone knows, yeah, this, this, I've yeah. been screwed probably by a dozen like gurus. Not, not all bad. But like when I say screwed is people try to teach me a topic that they didn't even fully understand. And I bought into the marketing because I used to have, I, when I was making a lot of money, I go, okay, this guy for 20 grand, this guy for 30 grand, all like pie in the sky. Very rarely have they ever worked out. And yeah. I'm just like, why we make this so complicated. It's so freaking simple. It's just, you find people that need to sell their properties and you just put it all together and no one will tell you the truth about this business. It's not easy. Yeah. But like once you figure it out, it's really not hard either. You just, you got to do what nobody else is willing to do. And that's the truth. The reality is if I get a hundred people that tune in to go to my course, five or 10 will knock it out of the park. Mm -hmm. Why? Because not everybody's built for wholesaling. And I know that. Yeah. Yeah. But if you talk to a guru, his course or her course will fix all problems. And that's honestly, when you bought the course, you felt like it was a complete relief, right? Like, yep. oh yeah, I'm going to like, my life right? is going to change. <laughs> and then about Three to four weeks into it, you're like, oh, crap. I'm getting nothing here. And now they're doing the dance around. And eventually, they're going to lock me out of this course. Uh -huh. And let me ask you, do you have a lifetime access to that course? No. No. It's uh, yeah. after it ended, it's like 200 a month. Just, just to be don't in give, the- Don't give any names. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wanna, just like, be in there <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So you had to get some skill sets out of it. Like I, I believe oh, yeah. you got a lesson no, out of it. That's for sure. Yeah, but, I got I got um, pretty much the basics down. It's just the talking. That's all it is with me. So what I want to do is I want to work on specific strategies. So 
listen, we're all really good till it gets down to the negotiation. Like that's where everybody kind of goes, man, Rick, I get this pit in my stomach and I keep talking until like, I don't even want to talk about the price because I'm scared to death. And I'm here to tell you that it's natural. I've gone through the whole thing. So what you have to do is have some strategies in your hip pocket. So when that awkward negotiation comes up, you can drop the bomb and not get kicked out of the house. That's the only goal mm -hmm. of our conversation here. Okay. So let me ask you this. Have you tried, uh, do you understand good cop, bad cop? Yes. You ever heard about it, right? Yeah. Uh, you guys are my bad cops. <laughs> Correct. You and, you and so Zach. guys, good cop, bad cop squares. So Jesus, if you're in front of the seller, which one are you? I'm the good cop. You always have to be the good cop when you're standing in front of that. You got to be the likable person, the reasonable person. My partner, Rick, he's nuts. <laughs> he sit behind a desk. He's got nothing better to do. Could crunch numbers. I don't agree with everything he's saying. And like, you have to act like you're the intermediary of trying to make this work. So let's paint a scenario. Okay. Say um, the lady wants 200,000 for her house. You can't pay more than a buck. You can't pay more than 155 that's like your mao so you and me had to Zeus, like don't pay a dime more of that and show me you're the hero that's what oh, i used to yeah. do my son i go you're not paying a dime more than that and show me the hero all right and so everybody wants to come back and go i got it for a hundred <laughs> never works that way so what you have to do is do the good cop bad cop so if it's 200 you got to find a way so say you've built great rapport and you're having a conversation now you got to make the offer so if you understand one, you can't do more than 155. That's it. That's your max. If it's more than 155, it doesn't work. We won't even get into the repairs or conditions is how do you do the good cop, bad cop to present that offer? So I'm going to be Janet, the mm -hmm. seller, and I want you to use the good cop. Remember, you're, you're not going to do anything wrong. I just want you to get through it Dad. and then we'll correct it a little bit. And I'll let you try it one more time. And then if everybody understands how good cop, bad cop works, remember the good cop, you're taking the stress off of you and you're putting on this crappy person that you're stuck with. Mm -hmm. And then when I go dark as the seller, you have to save the deal. No, 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 Janet. Like, so remember, I, I agree with you. I, and here's my favorite words. I'm on your side. I'm on your but side. It's got to make sense. Yeah. My partner says, says we can't pay more than this. And here's the secret. I'm not going to tell you everything. 155 is the MAO. And I promise you, after this five-minute exercise, okay. you're going to be very happy because it's you, once you understand how to do this, like Thank you can go to your hip pocket because uh, in a day or two, yeah, it's it's be there. the exact same scenario and you got to do it. So uh -huh. here we go. We're into the conversation. We've already done full conversation. We, we've done we've done all the qualifying. You know she's qualified. Sell the price. We just got to get it for the right price. If you pay more than 155 you're going to be in huge trouble. Yeah. So here we go. Hey, listen, hey, Zeus, I like everything you present. Um, can you do 200? 200? Uh, I don't even. <laughs> okay, how, how should this go? You, so I'm trying to put you on the spot because yeah. this is how it works. So you got one or two choice. You go. Uh -huh. You know what? In the perfect world, 200 probably works fine. Okay. But, you know, we got a few issues here, and, you know, you told me you wanted a quick sale. I tell you what, let me, let me do this. Yeah. Let me just – so if you're uncomfortable, you can break it up. Do you mind if I just check with my partner real quick? That will give you a break to kind of gather. you got to be careful. Of that. Yeah. I can just go over and have like a 30-second break. You don't even have to talk to him. Just talk to the mm -hmm. wind. And then once you do that, she's going to stare you right in the eye, and she's waiting to hear what your partner had to say. So you're going to be forced to spit it out. I only do that is if you're uncomfortable pulling out the bad cop right off the bat because I could tell you were. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm giving you that out. So Jesus, listen, I think it's worth 200. Can you know what what can you do? I know you probably can't quite pay 200. You got to make a little bit of money, but will 200 work for you? Well, considering that you wanted a quick sale and you know the on what the property looks like. Uh, my partner, Rick, he's, he's the real numbers guy. And, and the number he came back to me with was 150. Are you nuts? I'm so on you're your willing side, to offer 150 on it? 
No, no, no. This is not me. This, like I said, it's my partner Rick. He's he's a crazy guy. I know. I say the same thing to him. Uh, but one fifty so, is what we're at. Okay, so let's take a break here. So remember, if your maximum allowable offer is one fifty five, you start at one fifty. You, you're you're almost standing on the cliff to start with. Okay, yeah, that's where I was unsure. Of. Because so I like, go lower. So you remember the go for no strategy means you oh, build yeah. enough rapport. You're confident you're not going to get kicked out the door, but you're you're going to get punched. Mm -hmm. The idea is you just don't want to get punched out the door. So yeah. you can never. This is the biggest problem everybody has when they're dealing with motivated sellers. Everybody offers too much. And you're offering a price based on what you think the seller's is. So honestly, if I was, say I was your boss and you were my acquisition, I go, listen, you can't pay more than 155. The last thing you can do is start out with an offer at like 150. Okay, yeah. You got to come in at like below your kneecaps. So if you guys do not trust your lips, which I didn't when I first started, uh -huh. take whatever offer you're going to do and minus off 30 grand right off the bat. So you were going to offer 150. So go, I'm going to do the $30,000 effect with Rick. I'm going to take off 30. I'm off her 120. You know you're going to get lit up. That's yeah. when you bring in the bad cop. Okay. Go listen. So let's try it from there. I'll blow up on you. And then you have to repair the damage with the seller. You know, listen, my partner's a little bit nuts, but he has looked at the numbers. I might have some room. And okay. then you are looking for the counter. Okay. So yeah. you guys are looking for a yes on the first offer and you're going to get killed on that. You don't want to do that strategy. So listen, Zeus, I... Yeah, you know, I think it's worth roughly about 200. I know you guys got to make a little bit of money on it, but I think that's a a fair accurate assessment number. So, you know, what what are you thinking about offering me on it? Well, my partner Rick, he's a he's a real numbers guy and he came and he crunched them real good and he came back with the uh, 120 is what we could do. I'm sorry. What'd you say? 120. Dude, who's this Rick guy? Are you are you guys nuts? You, no, no, no. He's my smoke something before you got here. <laughs> no, he's he's a crazy guy, but 120. But I could I could I could do something for you if if you could meet me in the middle somewhere from your 200. Okay, so never say the middle right off the bat because now uh -huh. you're pointing, you you want to get their authentic answer. Okay. So this is where you have to just sit back and go. Listen, Rick's a little bit nuts. He is good with the numbers. That's why I keep him in the office with the money. I agree with somebody you're saying, but I'm trying to find out if we can work something out. So basically you've already told, you know, 120, what, what, what can you, you know, what do you think? Like, so now you got to volley it back to him and you got to yeah. let her give the number. You can't give the number. And then this is where she's going to say, well, this is where you're looking for. I go, listen, I talked over my husband and we can never take anything less than $146,000. So you know what this means is now your range is 146 to 120. And now Guess what, Jesus? Now you're negotiating before yeah. you're just talking. Now you have the range. The question is, can you dial it in? Most likely, you probably talk her at 140 or below. And remember, if I was your boss or your partner, I said 155 works. You always want to go back and prove the value of having a conversation with people. So if you start at or near the MAO, you have nowhere to go with that client. So at the end, if you, we, so say we haggle and now I wind up at like 140. You make me feel special as a seller because like I like we all like you worked your way up. Mm -hmm. The problem is the minute you tell me like 150 something, I know that's the least I know that's the least amount I'm gonna get for the property. So you size up, I size up. Here's how I look at it. When they give me the counter offer, I know that's the maximum I want to pay if I want a no haggle price. I know they're not gonna take 120. So the reality is we're probably between 125. And 145 at that point, and 140, something like that. And that's it. Your job's just to push that number down. So if you come in at 140 and you and your partner said 155, you did a hell of a deal. The problem is when you guys chase the MAO and you start with it because you just want to get a yes off the bat, you're, you're debt. You, there's nowhere to go with the conversation because okay. you're scared you're going to get rejected with the go for no. The key is you have to build rapport, have a conversation, and go, listen, I know Rick's a little bit nuts. That's why I'm here talking to you. And I get it. I, you know what? That's why I leave him in the office and you got to just separate. Like I'm on your side. I want to make this work. You need to get the house sold. We obviously have the cash for it. You said this. And then once they give their number, you just, you just kind of go back and you just massage, you keep massaging it. And you just keep testing it. 
Yeah. And here's what they do. They look at like what you just counted and you look what they come down. So if she went to 200 and now she goes 195, we're not getting anywhere. And I'm not going to waste my time with that person. But once they go, listen, I can't go below 146 because I owe this, 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 and that. Now I have all the intel. If I listen really good, now I can probably okay. put the perfect offer yeah. and do another trial close and do it. So let's try it one more way. You ready for this? Uh, let's do one where we do um, – um, uh, let's, let's do, uh, do you know the scrunchy face close? I don't think I'm good at it. <laughs> okay. So this one, it worked really well for me to fit my personality. So a scrunchy face, every negotiation, when it gets down to the numbers, it's tense, no matter what it is. It's yeah. if you're buying something at the store or you're buying a piece of like you get into this tension. And so the weird thing is the seller feels your tension and they feel like you can actually upset a seller by you being all clammy and tight. So one of the ways to do it is I, I was taught this a um, long time ago by Peter Conte, a really good um, creative finance um, real estate. And by the way, guys, everybody learns real estate from someone. If someone says they figured it out on their own, they're full of crap. So back in the days I went and I went in an intense workshop and they just taught you the scrunchy face thing. And by the way, they use it in all industries. It just says, uh, when you make an offer, uh, make the uncomfortable part and put it on your shoulders and wear it for your seller. That's it. So say you're at the point and she's like, well, you know, Rick, make me an offer. I go, ah, you know, I kind of thought about it. It's hard to come up with the numbers. I know you said like 200, but like, like 110, like, is that something you'd be interested? So you can go either way with it. She can tell you, you know, F you get out of my house. I go, I, I didn't think you were going to take that. And that's why I just kind of like, it was just hypothetical. So you, you ever make a joke with someone? Yeah. You know what they say when people make a joke, right? What's the saying when someone tells you a joke? It's just a joke. <laughs> There's always some truth behind people's joke. Yeah. That's why they made the day. Yeah. 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 So it's the same thing with that. So when you do the scrunchy face, you're like, yeah, I don't know. We take a hundred grand for it. I'm just stabbing in the dark. And shut your mouth. You would be shocked what people will say to you. And if they say no to you, you go, that's what I thought. Okay. So when yeah. you do the scrunchy face, you take all the pressure and you kind of put it on yourself. And they're like, okay. they want to try to help you out. And they're like, yeah. they go, but listen, if you could do like 145, like we might be able to do a deal. I go, Phew. once again, scrunchy face, like, <laughs> wow. You know, it's oh. kind of a bigger number than what I wanted to do. Um, and then that's when I'll start negotiating. Hey, what if I paid closing costs? What if I did this? So you should always know what your MAO is, but that MAO has to stay internally to you and you can never share it with anybody. As bad as you want to share it, because you both are playing poker and it's just the truth. The problem is that they play too extreme poker. You're going to have to play the game and you're actually going to have to walk away from it and come back to get a really good deal. Mm -hmm. So, By the way, I don't play poker. I suck at it. <laughs> and uh, I, I feel like... I gamble full time, although I know the house odds, so I'm okay with it. With poker, I have no competitive advantage, and uh, I can't do it. So, so we just taught you. We did the scrunchy face. We did oh. the bad cop. I'm going to save one more for someone else. Sure. Is there anything else I can help you out with, Jesus? Uh, honestly, no. But uh, I'm going to keep in contact because I'm 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 going to call this uh property in uh Toby, and I have a good feeling. So. Okay. We'll make uh, it work, to man. You, you, you know how yeah. to get a hold of me, man. Like, yes. you know. So uh -huh. I appreciate you doing that. So, I, guys, I want you to understand is one of the biggest problems in wholesaling is you guys are really good at building rapport. You're really good at qualifying. Uh, everyone's very nervous about getting the negotiating part. So you just have to have a trigger to go for it. And here's another little tip. When you guys get nervous and you know you're getting close to the uh, negotiation, you'll start talking more and you won't shut up. And so what you have to do is kind of have a trigger switch. So here's what I tell a seller after 10, 15 minutes tops, I go, listen, I could talk to you all day about your kids. And I promise you when we're done dealing with the house, we'll continue that conversation. It really like they go, Oh yeah, that'd be great. But remember, I'm here to see if I can help you out with your house, regardless of which way you go, I'm going to help you if I buy it or not. And then you just get in the numbers and just go with it. So make, if you're talking too much, go, listen, I could talk all day. And I promise you at the end of the day, I will, we'll go outside and we'll continue this awesome conversation if I buy your house or not. <laughs> so you do a little bit of a takeaway and then you go yeah. into it. 
you're gonna you're you're gonna get beat up. They're gonna get beat up a little bit, and then either you walk out with a deal or not. And by the way, guys, when people say no to you, they they tend to do you a favor. The worst ones in the world are the maybes, and you have to do the upfront conversation, just like we teach over at freewholesaling.com. So thank you, Jesus. Make sure I would I practice those it. too. They're very good Florida techniques. I don't know why they work really well in Florida, but they work okay. all over the country. I've <laughs> done a lot more than the state of Florida. So keep doing it and working on it. And remember, yeah. you have to get to the negotiating part to start negotiating. You have to start it. And the only way you start it is you have to have a very awkward conversation and go, listen, would you take 100? Do you scrunch your face? Good cop, bad cop. Okay. Then. Um, I got a lot more in the, in the pipeline. But yeah. <laughs> once you do that conversation, get out, you can decide if you're going to go – and move on with this person or not. Sometimes it doesn't work out, but that's why we qualify and we have the right list up front. Most of the time it just comes down. Will they give you a good deal? And remember 70% of our deals are on the follow-up. So even when they don't take your deal, it doesn't mean you're not going to get it. It just needs it. We need more work and more time. Okay. okay. I'll get in. I'll talk yep. to you about See you. Mm -hmm. See, that's awesome, man. I think I, I got one or two more that we can uh, share with them on here. Or so, um, Let's see. Okay, let's see who else is up for it. Uh, okay. Yo, you there? Rick, what's going on? Good, man. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. I'm actually uh, cold calling right now while I'm watching this live. Okay, well, am I screwing you up here? Or you want me to come back to you? or? No, no. I actually want to... Uh, do a role play to see. Uh, okay. Play. Awesome. So, um, one of the other ones is, uh, so are you comfortable in the transition to, um, the, the biggest challenge everybody I talk to is just getting down to like the negotiations without making it feel like this terrible tense situation. So you know what I'm talking about, right? Yes. So one of my favorite one is, and this one's extremely common when they just won't give you a price, but you know there is motivation there. Maybe it's a foreclosure, pre-foreclosure. Maybe the house is completely trashed and they moved out. And they get to that, they're like, well, you know, just uh, equivalent, just uh, give me your offer. And they just like, it gets really weird. Because, listen, guys, in the perfect world, your seller gives you the first offer. Like, don't give me, I'm a big fan of that because it makes it a lot easier but there's a big percentage of people out there that were taught whoever speaks first, you lose. And I'm here to tell you that's not necessarily true. That's an old wise tale. It is helpful, but you've got to be smarter than the average person and go, okay, how can I get an answer out of this person if they won't give me an answer? And you just have to play around with your words and you have to trick them subconsciously. So if you want to practice this, I don't know if you've ever heard of this one or how we do it. We just call it the volley method. And if, if you ever played any type of, I guess it's like tennis, volleyball, or like ping pong, when you hit it over, the other person's job is they have to hit it back over to you or they lose a point. And that's how I, like, when you look at people that won't give you any answers, you're going to have to play with them to get them to give you an answer. So if the property's motivated, by the way, I don't do this. If they're not motivated, I won't even waste my time doing this one because this is a nightmare for retail people. They're crazy. So- they go, I get down to it. I said, you know, Hey, I like everything about your property. Um, and no one will spit a number out. So you haven't spit out a number. She won't spit out a number. He won a number. Like, how do you do this? And I always teach you the volley method. If you ask them enough questions, they eventually have to give an answer because they get frustrated. So, um, so let's pretend this. Um, why don't I do this? You're, you're going to come in and like you've, you've qualified everything. You know, I'm not talking much and I'm just being super quiet and you're getting a little bit frustrated with me. So now you have to try to do the volley method. So the whole point of the volley method is when they ask, when they answer a question and they don't answer it, you have to serve them back. And all you do is rephrase the question and you put another spin on it. If you ever went to a Tony Robbins seminar, that will drive you nuts with this technique. Because if you learn... If you want to buy time, you just take that person's question or answer and you just rephrase it and then you add whatever you want on the end of it. So like, here's an example of it. Um, Mr. Seller, what, uh, Mr. Seller, what do you need to get for this house? And then, so let's do it the other way around. I'm going to let you do it. So 
um, you're going to ask me, Hey seller, what do you need to get? What do you need to get out of this house? Because that's, that's where I love to do it. So tell me it. Okay. So if I were to close this in about 30 days, what price would you need to be at for this for, to work for you? I don't know. You're the professional. Why don't you give me the number? So th well, this uh, is it. So now so you, you have a choice. You can sit there and stare at them and like just want to punch them in the face. Or you have to play with them. So Tony Robbins taught me this technique 15 years ago. Instead of confronting people, dance with them. So I'm terrible at dancing. I'm one of the worst dance partners you'll ever meet. But instead of fighting with them, just play with the flow. So it went over the net. I said, I don't know. You tell me. And now if you keep going back, they are, uh, they are under an urgent situation to answer you. And here's how I respond to this. You ready? Listen, listen, Sue, I know you don't know. But if you did know, what price do you think you need to sell it for? Did I ask her any different? It's the same question. I just changed the wording around. And what happens after a while? She'll get frustrated and answer it. It just out of pure necessity to shut you up. And I know it's a little bit devious, but it works. By the way, I've gone six and seven times doing that. And all you have to do is practice. Now, please, guys, do not use this on the ladies because I don't want to come back. And if you use it two or three times, they'll figure out what you're doing and it will blow up in your face. So, um, like, here's an example. You ready for this? Um, my wife does this to me all the time. Hey, honey, uh, where, uh, let's just go out to eat tonight. Where do you want to eat? I don't know. Whatever you suggest. And she'll go, well, what, what if we go over to, uh, I don't know, uh, Chili's? I'm like, yeah, Chili's is fine. She's like, you know, I'm not sure if I'm feeling Chili's. Do you want to go to another place? I go, honey, I just answered the question. And so you can either decide to get in a confrontation or you just playfully just keep kicking the can back and forth. After two churndowns, they're going to want to try to answer you with the right question because that's how they're wired in life for. So you're going to do the. So I'm going to tell you, you, you've just asked me, what do you need to get out of this house? And I'm going to go back to you. You know, I don't know. You're the professional. You tell me. So now you're going to just rephrase the question. You're going to exact the exact same question. You just take their words and play with it. I know you don't know, but if you did know, what do you think that price would be? And then guess what? When I do that, I'm going to come back to you and go, well, I go, you called me. You're the one who reached out with me, a postcard. I like you. But once again, I'm going to defer to you. So now you can't say the same thing. So you got to go, listen, I tell you what, just pie in the sky numbers. Just give me a ballpark of what you need to get out of this to see if I can even do a deal with you. So now I'm going to pull back a little bit and I'm just going to rephrase it. After two times, 90% of the people will answer you just out of frustration. But the problem is when I shoot it over your bow, the reason they give you that answer is they're trying to blow you off and see if you're going to go away. And if you've ever met a, like a really, now I always say wholesaling is not sales, but when it comes to this part, it's just knowing how to rephrase the question and keep bouncing it. So what you need to do is practice with someone that you can keep bouncing because there's something in human nature when I can give you an instant answer, even though it's complete BS, like it's not a lie, but it's just, I just rephrase the question is they feel a lot higher degree of confidence in you. I know you don't know it, but if you did know, what would, what would the price be? Go listen, Rick, I really don't know. Like I I'm in the clue on it and I just go, listen, all you have to do is ballpark it. There's no pressure here. Honestly, I got to find out if I can even buy the house. So I do a little bit of takeaway. And after you do it at least twice, 90% of the time, they're going to give you an answer every time. Here's the problem, though. And I'm not picking on you. Like I'm just, this is a great learning thing is if you sit there and just stare at them and you don't know how to answer them, it's very weird and uncomfortable. And remember, we've broken the rapport barrier and we're having a conversation, but this is the point where it can get a little bit challenging. So if you're okay with that, remember a volley is just rephrasing the question and basically asking the same things, just adding some words in there. So you don't ask the same thing. Cause if I ask you, no, 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 Beth, Janet, whatever, what's really your price. Now you're going to tick people off. So let's try it. So all you have to do is a lot of times is when they tell you the question, you can use the first part of how they answer it to restructure it. So she goes, I don't really know you're the professional. I go, I'm far from the professional. And I know you don't know. But if you did know, what price would make this work for you? 
All I did was take the first part of her question and then I put a little bit of a spin on it. I just, act, I just asked the exact same question. So you okay? You want to practice it? And by the way, you can't get this wrong. There's no pressure here. By the way, I learned this technique over 12 years. I didn't pick it up in like a day or two. I just, I find that dead time is either your dead silence in a negotiation, which is very effective, or you have to talk. And you can't say the same thing over and over because it sounds desperate. Hold on one second. Uh, oh. Sorry, I got some company in the studio. So you want to give it a shot? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so uh, uh, where is it? So you basically say, listen, you know, what do you need to get out of the property? So you just spit that out. I'm just like, listen, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Like, I think you're the professional. I think you probably know the best price to offer me. What do you think? I know you don't know, but if you had a price range, where would you be at for this for, to work for you? You asked some hard questions. You know, I just, it's, it's a very, like, it's a, like, I don't know. I could be like all over the board and I don't want to screw up this deal with you. So can you just like, give me a number? It might be easier for both of us. And then, uh, will I just rephrase it again after that? Re and the, the thing is you can buy time while you're talking. Remember, you're, you're just kind of, you're just rephrasing the question. There's no wrong answer, but what happens when you get into this thing and you don't answer back and you let 30 seconds go by, it turns really like you lose a lot of progress in your rapport building skills. So think you guys have to think about when you're talking to your buddies, you never have dead space when you're talking to your friends, like. You guys can spit it off even if you don't know the answer because you're extremely comfortable with them. So you got to stop worrying about like analyzing every word. You're never going to say it perfect. They're just looking to see if you're going to continue the conversation. And when you keep asking somebody the same question three or four different ways, by the way, this is a trick lawyers use when they do depositions. Ask me how I know. It works extremely effective. So stop worrying about the exact words you use. All it is is a volley. And sometimes you might even say the wrong words and it's okay with it. So the first one you said, I know you don't know, but if you did know, what would it be? And so all you are is rephrasing what they said and putting a final spin on it on the same question. So on the third one, I might use an example like, um, so she just came back and gave you like a BS answer. Like, oh my, like I, you're the professional. I go, listen, even professionals screw this up. If you just tell me what you want, this will probably be easier for both of us because maybe I can get you what you're asking for. It's a little bit of a shocking answer, but honestly, like here's what I tell you. If you just tell me the truth, we can cut to the chase. Well, however, you have to keep playing with the words, but I'm telling you after two tries, they'll typically go under your spell. Life is all about hypnosis, guys. Either you're being hypnotized or someone's hypnotizing you. By using this words, you're dancing with them and you're playing with them. It's not bad. It's better than the, what's the, what's the, I'm sorry, I can't give you more than 110,000 for it. You're never going to get anywhere doing this. So if they're qualified, the properties a fit and they're playing around with the numbers, you, you can't do it. And then after three times, they completely reject you. You got to kind of stop. And then you just go straight to the low bull offer. Go out. Well, Cause honestly, it makes it easier. So pretend she rejected you three times. She's like, I don't know. I don't know. Ballpark. I don't know. And I go, well, listen, if you're not going to give me a number, I'm just going to throw one out there. Don't shoot the messenger. Would you consider a hundred thousand dollar offer and just kind of scrunchy your face? Cause now you have a reason to give her a low ball offer. Cause she won't give me, give a starting number. And you have to, because if she gives you a pie in the sky number, where are you going to go with it? And so what's your, what's your excuse? If she goes, are you crazy? Did you not get any sleep last night? Do you know what number you just told me? How do you respond? I was just telling her that uh, I was just throwing a price out there just to see where she would be at. Correct. So this is where you bring in your motion. Go, listen, like you didn't give me a number. I got to start somewhere. Tell, tell me what you're thinking. How did that make you feel? And they'll go pissed off. Okay. Well, just that's why I was trying to find out what number you need to make this work. Have you talked it over with your husband? or your significant other, whatever. And just like, you're always looking to get a counter. I, the last thing I want is just a pure number. I want to hear things like I spoke it over with my mom and we agree. We can't take anything less than $155,000 because this is what we need to get over here and do that. And it's like, 
Oh crap. Now I have all the information I need. Now I can figure out if I can structure an offer. And guys, that's it. When you start with your MAO, it's a disaster. So let's try it once again from start to finish. And the idea is to help everybody understand this because you guys are really good at rapport in the conversation. When it comes to like the negotiation, a lot of you are like a deer in the headlights. I've, cause I've been on the phone with a bunch of you guys and we're talking to them. You've got to keep that conversation piece going, no matter how stupid the conversation is. Conversations are fluid and flowing, right? So you got to look at it like a river and stop worrying about making mistakes. And sometimes you can just pause and go, my God, what's the price? Let me think about this. And you can take time to do it instead of just saying, um, ah, and just staring at someone. So it's very awkward. Have you ever been in a room with someone and make an offer on the phone and you get that just weird awkwardness on the negotiations? No, I haven't experienced okay, that. Okay, it's terrible. It's, it's not fun. So let's try it from start to finish. You asked me, go ahead. Hey, what do you need to get for this price, Rick? Hey, what would you need for this house? I don't know. I figured I'd, I would kind of leave it to you. You can make the offer and we'll see if it works. Well, if you had a price in your head, what would you need to work for this? You know, I, I haven't really overly thought about this myself too much. But like, what would you recommend? I would recommend, uh, I'm not the best at the numbers. Uh, that's really my partner thing. Uh, so I think if you told me a price, then I would be able to give you a price, a counter offer. So that's perfect. So like uh, guys, even like that, as long as you have the back and forth, it's a conversation. It's not a like, let's fight each other till we get what we need to do. Because like you're perfectly like, like, so, I don't know, but like, listen to the key words I said. I personally haven't completely thought about, which means she's talked to someone else about it. Who else have you talked to about like coming up to, for the right, uh, for what you need to get out of the house? Always use the word need because if they have a want, I can't fulfill it. A need, I can fulfill a want, I can't do it. So sometimes if, so the skill set of using your ear, when she says that, I'm like, okay, she's got an opinion, but someone else is leaning in her ear. It could be a husband. It could be a business partner or anything like that. And just use the signs of doing it. I'll go, well, listen, let me ask you, whoever you've talked to, what, what number have you guys come to a conclusion on? And then you can see if you can wreck the fire with it. But the idea is you keep the flow going. By the third time, they'll always give you a price. And if someone just stone calls you like this, you probably got to go back to report and figure out what's going wrong with it. And that's how all negotiate. Guys, you don't start negotiation until you hit them with like a low ball number. Because if you hit them with the MAO, you can't negotiate anymore. It's over. Like, what are you going to do? Are you going to go to 151, 152? Like it's, it gets ridiculous. And that when people say, Hey, I want to meet you in the halfway. Like I know there's a book on splitting the difference. I heard it's a really good book, but like when we're talking wholesale numbers, sometimes splitting the difference is a really good deal. If you start with the go for no, it usually works. If you start with the MAO, it's a nightmare. So, um, I appreciate you uh, working along with it. You got a question I can help you answer. Yeah, actually just a quick question. Yeah. Um, so when you file for like the code violations in like different townships and stuff, mm -hmm. uh, do they actually check your home address? Because I had, uh, I've got the code violations for my city, yeah. but when I did like the outskirts, I put my address and it was like, uh, we can't give you the code violations because it's not an address in our township. So I was wondering, do they look up your address or? You're talking about your personal address? Yeah. Um. I mean, that's just BS stuff. Like, I, I don't know why that would matter. But once again, the argument here is always it's going to be versus um, um, public information, which you're talking about code violations, right? Code violations. Yeah. So we all agree it's public information. The problem you're trying to penetrate is the privacy policy of that township or city. And that's where a lot of people go. I'm just going to I'm going to I'm going to file a FOIA act and they have to cooperate. Well, the problem is they write these ridiculously privacy policies. Um, it's like the gym I go to, there's, there's like a, a general manager. He's a pain in the butt, like a nightmare. He doesn't own the gym. He just gets a paycheck, but he literally tells everybody what they can do, how you can drop away. It's, it's like super annoying. So if you don't appease to the general manager, you're never going to get like the full access like to the gym. 
So when it comes to any type of town, especially code violation, you have the public information. I'm here to tell you guys, do not try to win that debate because you're wasting your time because filing a FOIA act is a nightmare. This particular issue is probably a little privacy thing they put in to, to filter people out. So you're either just going to have to flat out trick them. I'm not a big fan of lying to people. Or you have to decode what their privacy policy is and figure if you can get around that. I've never personally happened to have them. That's the first I've ever. I've been flat out denied, which I think is even worse. So go get a buddy's address. And she's probably just putting in a computer and disqualifying you right off the bat. Right. So go get another address. I like, how are they going to correlate you to that address? Are they really going to go that far? Because remember, you don't have to own a property to live there. You could just be leasing it out. And to be honest, with you, anybody can write a lease. There's no way to verify it. So figure out what their privacy policy is. And once you understand the rules, then you can navigate around. It. It's just like paying your taxes or if you want to play the game of Monopoly. He or she that reads and understands the rules will do the best. Period. I did. I, I tell you, I've had a twelve-year-old kick my butt in Monopoly. You know why? Because the kid knew every rule in Monopoly. <laughs> guess you can guess who that was. And I still won't play him to this day. Zachary's just—he'll destroy you in Monopoly. Like I, I probably should have never brought that game out as a kid. So I'm telling you guys, if you just read the rules, it's crazy. Because you should buy. And once you, you played Monopoly enough, you learn like you just buy everything you can and be cash poor as long as you can. And if you can hold out about four trips around the board, you own everybody. Right. And all, all Monopoly is trying to teach everybody in this world is if you sacrifice now, the bounties are endless in the future. That's all Monopoly is. So like it took me 35 years to understand the game of Monopoly. And most people pay Monopoly like, eh, I'm just going to do like the whole idea is to own the board and make everybody pay you. It's, it's like a dig to the man. You know what I'm saying? So it's, uh, it's a privacy policy, so just like figure out what it is and figure out how to penetrate it, and that's all you need to do. Don't try to like rationalize the rules; they're ridiculous. Because it's some manager sitting in an office and like, how can I discourage less people like you calling and asking for this list? And they go, well, make sure they live in this town first. I'm here to tell you, there's no way they can verify where you live. So you could write a lease tomorrow. Like, what are they going to do? Then they have to. Are they really going to go through that much underwriting to figure it out? I don't think they will. I think they'll give up. So it's just an initial filter. Just find a way to get through it. So I have not heard that, but am I surprised by it? Absolutely not. Okay. People are crazy. These privacy policy guys, they're getting nuts. We're having the same issue in our business too. It's like, guys, I've been coming here for 15 years. Like who? And like, so every time we switch a new employee, we have to deal with it. So anything else? No, that's all I have for now. You got it. So I appreciate you. So I'm just teaching you guys that how you overcome anybody, any motivated seller is you just got to get to the negotiation part and you got to find a tactful way to do it. And when they start stone calling you, you got to have techniques in your bag and just practice them. See, I'm telling you, volleying, it's one of the most powerful things you can ever do. It drives people nuts. And guys, next time you're at a party, play with it. You don't even have to do this in real estate. You do it with all your friends and stuff. Just don't do it with your significant other. That's the one that will blow up on you. I tried it. She goes, I know what you're doing. I know what you're doing. You're just rephrasing the question until I give you the real answer. I go, is it working? She goes, now that I know what you're doing, it doesn't work. So the whole point of volleying is get someone's subconscious answer. Because if you ever got frustrated and just tell someone like, I can't go. My mom won't let, like I used to be a kid, like my friends are like, come on, Rick, we're all going out. Like, I can't go. I'm grounded. I'm sorry. I tried to cover it up. I can't, I can't leave. I'm like, okay, well, we got to the truth on that, right? Got to miss the days of being grounded. <laughs> no mortgage payment, no financial commitments. I was like, grounding was like a luxury. And I didn't even understand it because um, actually when I got grounded is when I found out Tony Robbins because back when I was young, we didn't have the internet. We, we didn't have like, we didn't have smartphones. You just find a book and read it. So I sat down and read a book for four hours. I go, wow, people really live like this amazing stuff. So. Okay, bud. Let me know if you need anything else. You know where I'm at. All right. Talk to you soon. Okay, man. I'll see you. So, guys, you, you, I, I hope everybody kind of gets the gist of it. If you just figure out how to talk to people and just play with them, like during a negotiation, um, the old school days of people headbutting each other in a negotiation. It's and it, honestly, if you're so far apart, I don't negotiate with like retail. I don't. I only fight with the people that are qualified for the property because it drives me nuts. So 
What's up, Mason? What's going on? Not much, not much. He's got his uh, Houston Astros on, man. All day, every day. Yeah, uh, my, my baseball team I can't even talk about anymore. It's been sold and traded so many times. We got rid of all our good players. The messy Marlins, I call them. 97 and 2003. That's the only time they're ever going to make me happy in my life. They won those years? Yeah, it's crazy. Like they were like the, one of the one of the in uh, 1997. Um, I was a lot younger back then, but uh, I truly get the hype behind. So I grew up with baseball. Like my dad was a huge baseball guy, but um, watching them from start to finish go to the World Series was one of the most amazing things I've seen. Like it's so you have to appreciate baseball to understand how hard it is to get there and then how everything has to go just perfect. And uh, it was fun to watch back then. That's when the Marlins were like were exciting, but it's I, I, I don't think they'll ever see a championship in our lifetime again because they screwed the city over so bad and it's just a bad deal. But I do I do appreciate uh, MLB playoff baseball, but like every day you really gotta love baseball to watch 160 some odd games. Yeah. But I, I did I did uh, one entire year, like every game. I even had season tickets. Um, and I enjoyed it. It's like it's its own atmosphere. So I grew up watching um, minor league, and then obviously here in Florida, minor league's like pretty cool. So if you like, you know, like we're right next to the Mets, uh, the Cardinals. Somebody, oh the uh, uh, I, the Nationals. So they're all within twenty minute drive each way. Pretty cool, intimate stadium. So, anyways, I got all my kick there. That's my AD, my ADHD kicking in. So. I love baseball, but unfortunately, I don't have much to follow over here. So, come over to Houston. Yeah, you guys got something good over there, yeah, man. I got so I listen. I tell you what, I used to have, I had my my little. Uh, I used to collect the uh, the uh, baseball helmets when I was a kid, and like the Houston Astros. Like I just thought it was the coolest helmet ever. I was like, I always loved their logo. They really freaking nailed it. So, what's going on, man? What can I help you out with? Um, not much, not much. I was kind of just listening, um, doing that. And I, I was, I was using Zach's script where it's just like, Hey, are you the owner of one, two, three main street? Are you mm -hmm. interested in selling it? And now I decided to write down yours and try that out. Cause, um, I, I mean, it just seems like it's a lot more, cause a lot of people will they'll just shut it down real quick. Yeah. So keep in mind, there's, there's a difference when you're qualifying people, especially cold calling. Cause you have to get through the numbers game. Yeah. So you actually have to wear, um, if you think about baseball, it's like either you're, you're hitting or you're fielding. And so the reality is uh, when you're doing cold calls, you're pretty much in the field fielding balls to see if you can get one to come your way. And unfortunately, you got to have a bunch of balls hit your way and if you can get one and then if you can turn a double play or do something like that so you can go up the bat. When you're going up the bat, that's when you're going to the negotiations because that's how you're going to hit it out of the park if it's ever going to hit. Sometimes you get a single, sometimes you get a home run. But don't mix the two up. When you're qualifying people in cold calling, it is a numbers game and you have to be in that mode. Because if you talk to 300 people and only 10 people want to talk to you, you can't have long, exhausting conversations with like 300 people. You, you will never make it. You also have to be careful not to write everybody off because you're so used to people saying no to you when they say yes. You're like, what, what, what did you say? And I've done, I've even done that before. I'm like, are you sure? I'm like, Oh crap. I'm talking them out of it. So once you get them, there is the stuff I'm teaching you right now. And I really think it comes down to three techniques. It's the volley method, which, which I taught in that it's good cop, bad cop, and it's scrunchy face. And depending on the type of person I'm dealing with or how I feel, I know that sounds crazy, but that's how I do stuff. Sometimes that's how I respond. So in the beginning, you always pick one that you're most comfortable with and you hang your hat on it. Because when it comes to negotiations, people want to hear that you are confident in how you deliver, even if you don't know what you're doing. And if you really want to create a win-win situation for everybody involved, you just talk to them. And if you have a conversation, so think about your friend. Do you think you're going to have awkward conversations? Unless it's a really weird subject. It just flows. Even the bad conversations, they flow. When you're with a stranger, when you make it just like this, like you're never going to connect with them and do it. So just make sure you differentiate the two when, when you're, when you're prospecting, you're, you're just, you're digging up seeds and putting them in a barrel. And then once you have them in the barrel, then you have to like sort out that fine gold and see which one's going to work and which one's not. But if you try to sort out all the fine gold up front, it's torture, especially on cold calling. So 
just make sure you differentiate the two because you got to talk to a couple hundred people to get to those handful of people that had need to have that much deeper conversation. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And, um, then I also had a question. What is your y'all's typical, like whenever y'all are cold calling, what's y'all's typical answer rate? Um, so once again, I do not run that department. Zach, since Zach made close to a million, um, cold calls himself, I let him run that entire department because I never hired cold callers because I didn't know how to manage them. I, I didn't know what the call rate was or anything. So when Zach's on, he'll be on tomorrow through Friday through Thursday. I want you to ask him that exact number. Honestly, I don't have a report in front of me. I know it's, it's not huge. Like it's not a big number, okay. but you also have to ask yourself, what are the KPIs you're using and what do you consider like an answered call? So you have answered calls, you have voicemails, you have people that told you to F off and depending on how people qualify that will depend on um, the percentage of your number. So okay. some people only have like a two to 3% and then some include all the stuff and they'll, they'll say as high as nine or 10%. So the problem is if I compare that number with it, it's very misleading. So it's like, is it based on an answer rate or based on people that have intent to move forward to the next level of the conversation? And that's the problem with that. And by the way, I've been through everyone's stat. I don't believe it. Anyone's numbers, unless you show me how you break down the data, because it could be from 1% to 10%, depending on how you um, categorize those calls. Does it make sense? Yeah. So um, Zach is the absolute expert on it. I don't even look at that department because I'm clueless. I know it's an expensive department to run in our company and the numbers have gotten tougher, but it doesn't mean it doesn't work. It's just we're spending a little bit more money to get deals just like you guys are more gotcha. energy. So what else? Um, I mean, really that's it. Uh, I'm just doing cold calling and then I just started SMS texting. Um, yeah. and that, that was really it. That's all I had for questions. Okay, cool. Okay, Mason, let me know how it works out. Yes, sir. I appreciate it. Rick. Okay. Stay in. Later. Okay. Let's see here. Ba 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 ba. Who's up next? Alex, you there? Oh, Rick, what's up? What's going on, man? Hey, man. Oh, uh, uh, I heard what you said earlier about um about the uh, the courthouse being you know there's no there's no debating with them and you are right man i just i just spoke <laughs> with uh my local courthouse yeah and oh my god it was it was terrible <laughs> it, it's so you guys understand there's there's public policy public records and then they they create these rules within it and that they they all call it privacy policy and they're all hiding behind the privacy policy. So like, if you want to even try to navigate it without like completely killing yourself, figure out what their privacy policies are and figure out the rules of the privacy policy. And that's how you navigate it. So earlier, the gentleman I was speaking to, he's like, they won't give you the information unless I show them I live within that county or you know township. Well, dude, that's almost impossible. Like, so let me ask you, how many people are they going to hire to verify if you have a uh, utility bill, if your lease is legitimate? It's extremely expensive to do all that stuff. So a lot of times it's just meant to scare you off. Like my favorite one in our local township, they'll tell, they tell my employees all the time, um, you have to sit in front of the city attorney. Nine out of 10 people run because they, they're scared to death to talk to an attorney. So we sat down with the attorney 20 minutes and he's like, okay. But wow. my staff member, he goes, I'm not talking to the city attorney. I'm like, I'll go with you. It's not a big deal. We didn't do anything. And so right. that's part of their privacy policy because they have three steps to try to discourage you as much as possible. So by the way, if you prefend people at the courthouse or at like the city level, eventually you'll find someone that will show you the back door into every type of list that's there. It's not easy to get. I don't have a course. I don't have anything to teach you how to do it. And by the way, I've always told you guys, you will never get a hundred percent of your list. So if you have five lists you want to get, if you can get two out of the five, consider yourself blessed. This is how it works. The only list you will get zero uh, kickback on is the uh, foreclosure list because they have to make it very public. And even then sometimes they hide behind it. So figure out their is privacy policy the and just reverse engineer it. Like that's, that's all we do. And by the way, 
the frustrating part about the privacy policy, it's always moving and changing. So as soon as you figure it out, you come back three months later to get the same list. They're going to give you some other BS story. Somebody the other day, they want $10 to get the list. I go, just give it to them. Who cares? That $10, if you could pay $10 and get the list, and I'm not going to go through the shenanigans anymore, most of you would bend over backwards to get that, to pay them that 10 bucks. So, yeah. Oh, I hate paying yeah, for I hope I didn't like ruin that. my um hope I didn't ruin my relationship with the court people. I didn't really get like angry or, or disrespect them, but I was like, because I know that like you say always, like you're gonna get resistance and you know they're not gonna want to just give it to you right away. So yep. the lady was just telling me, Oh yeah, we don't have that list, we don't give it out. You can just look, uh you can look, they have like some kind of billboard at the entrance that just has like what I was looking for is probates. They have like a, a little billboard at the front entrance that has like maybe like six or seven like uh yeah. pages of, of probates on there she's like you can look at that i was like well i just want like the you know everything I, that it doesn't seem like there's anything there and like oh yeah. it was it was rough so well, I'm definitely gonna one try of the best again, ways but, uh, yeah it's just try to befriend the employees and help them navigate because remember the other day they're just getting paid a paycheck and they don't want you know they don't want any resistance so if you kind of make their life a little bit easier it's not a guarantee but I, I can tell you guys from 2003 to where it is now, it's like crazy. And I'm here to tell you right up to 2016, I never even got resistance getting any list ever. So you guys know what happened from 2013, 14 to today. We got infiltrated with thousands of wholesale gurus. And even though I create this problem, I don't charge you guys for it. So like I, 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 Hope you, I'm going to give you the tools to overcome it. No other guru gives you the tools to overcome these lists. I like, just go get it. The reality is you're going to get resistance. The easiest way to overcome it is persistence and understand the difference between privacy and public information. And it's like the game of Monopoly. If you read the rules and you understand them and like you're nice to people, but you're forthright, you can eventually get through. You're never going to get hundred percent. Like someone told me, I didn't get a, I asked for 10 lists. I only got nine. I'm like, Perfect. <laughs> like that's how goals work. If you want to buy 10 properties this year and you only bought eight, you're eight properties better than zero. Like stop beating yourself up about it and like find the victories in it and find the tools to get better with it. You guys, do you think I made up the uh, overcome resistance with persistence? I had a 15 year journey doing that really 20 when it comes down to it. But for like 15 years, I was in that dog fight every day. And I know the fight's even bigger today, but like, you guys have the tools and the technology to really get through like wholesaling. So what was hard when I started is I didn't understand how to do this business. Everything was trial by error, but it was easy to get the information. So like you got to pick your poison. Can you imagine if you went out there and nobody knew what was wholesaling is you didn't know how to get lists. You had to go manually pull everything and you had to pay a fortune to get the information or would you rather have it the other way? I'll tell you exactly what to do, but I'm going to tell you what your fights are and where you're going to get the most resistance. I would take it either way. It's the same fight. A lot of people are like, oh, you had it so easy back in 2003. I go, dude, I literally no felt way. like I was an alien on a different planet. Nobody understood what I do. <laughs> title companies were like, I don't even understand what you're doing. I could talk to 50 title companies. One or two would get what I did. They didn't even know what assignments were. They're like, I don't understand this crap. So like, understand like you have the information you just got to do the application of it and it's like i get it so which one did they give you the most resistance on well uh because I, I spoke to zach last week he told me that i needed to uh he wanted me to look for four lists which was one was pre-foreclosures the other one was evictions uh tax uh -huh. liens and probates so i was trying the probates uh and I, I was at first I went in person and I just asked them for everything. I, it was my first time there, so I didn't know what to ask for. And they yeah. just sent me to like their directory room where you can go on their computers and just access the county website, which I could do that from home anyways. Mm -hmm. um, and I w spoke to somebody. I was like, hey, uh, I'm, I'm trying to see if I can get like the most recent list that you guys have. Like if, how often do you guys update it? I didn't really know what to ask them for. And they were just referring me to whoever and. And then I tried calling today and the first call didn't go, go well. So uh, yeah. I, I, I tried calling another uh, courthouse because we have a really big county. Um, uh -huh. And then I called that one. But it turned out that after I called a different number, it led me to the same lady that I already spoke to. And she was oh already God. upset with me. <laughs> and she basically just hung up on me. Like she didn't even let me speak. Uh, it, yeah. was, it was bad.
that's the problem with the phone. So just kind of keep it at it, but you can't make people give you stuff. You can only try to tell them the benefit of giving you the stuff. So yeah. I think in the next month or so, I think we're going to have to do a dedicated uh, live, just how to like role play and talk to these people. Maybe we should just call some court systems live and just have fun. Yeah, with you, it. you should it's... wear some uh, some of those glasses that have cameras on them or something and, and walk in there in person. <laughs> Well, the thing is, uh, I, I wear contacts, so I'm blind up front and I'm blind like long distance. So it's uh, it's one of those nasty thing age does to you. So, but you know, just keep at it, and you know, all, all you can do is ask. Like it's it just. And I tell yeah. you, out of the blue, I've got a list I've waited years for. They're like here, I'm like, oh my god, two years we fought for that list. And by the way, I try yeah. some crazy lists to this stage, and there's a reason I don't recommend because some of them are so painful. It's it's just not they're good, but they're extremely advanced strategies, and it's just not like it's hundreds of dollars and like hours of your work, and uh, I can't get them to work consistently. That's why I don't teach them. So, but just keep doing what you're doing, and just find the people that want to work with you, and then just find the, what the privacy policy is, reverse engineer it, and then make your request for these government lists based on that information. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm gonna keep trying. Uh, hopefully, I can get at least one of them, or else I, maybe even I can do the because I know there's a way to pull probates online for a lot of counties. Uh, mm -hmm. But I also I did want to know um, for pre foreclosures. I know that uh, um, PropStream has like a quick filter for that one. I'm not sure. Do you know if the county uh, pre foreclosures are like more fresh than the ones that are on PropStream or? So whenever difference? you can get information directly from the county, it will beat any software service you do period okay. all the all information from from the county level leads but particularly government list they all derive from your mostly your county courthouse occasionally from like a city which code violation is the only thing that really doesn't come from the court house and the uh, fire damage properties but they come from city departments obviously you know where to get the fire damage you just gotta look for the fire trucks so um if you could ever so when I first started wholesaling, I went down to the county and I got their entire database. And then I had to sit with people that were much smarter than me, help me sort out because it was like 80,000 people at the time. By the way, the population's tripled since I've started wholesaling. And then we had to sort it out because I only, I only had like 300 bucks to market the people. So I would sit there for days, if not weeks, and figure out how was the best way to spend my $300. So getting information from the county is great. When you use services like listrei.com, um, which is our prop stream, they're very effective, but there is going to be a little bit of dated information on it. It's done by design because it's like they can't download the information every day. So typically what a prop stream is, and I'll have to get them on here with Zach to figure out when it, usually they're about two weeks, two to four weeks going to be where the court is because it takes time for that information to process and they can't push the pro the information every minute of the day. It's just too taxing on the court system. So I've always told you, if you can get the uh, the foreclosures, especially the pre-foreclosures from the courthouse, it's the best information to get because time is of the essence. And if you can catch someone as soon as they go on that list and somehow make a connection with them, you've got a great shot at it. Now, I do like PropStream because I can get like hundreds of them and just do a shotgun approach, but a lot of them, they're already working with someone and you're going to miss out about on half of them. So if you can effectively get it, what I like about the foreclosures is it's usually a pretty easy list to get. It's very public, and most of the counties will let you get them online. Okay. So, so as far as the pre-foreclosures, that one, like, is it more like in person or? Uh, you should have no issues getting that. It's a very public document. Like, I, I get all my, my pre-foreclosures um, online. I used to go in person and get them, but, like, there's no difference anymore. And by the way, it has to be public information. They can't hide it. So just yeah. ask for the uh, foreclosure department and then just, first of all, play with it online and figure it out. And then remember, you have the auction dates, which I hate. Now, I use that to verify what people are telling me, but I love people that just go freshly on the foreclosure list. That's your sweet spot. Because remember, now they're getting a notification. They got to make a decision what they're going to do. And after two or three months, they're like, wait a minute, nobody took the house. I'm not making any payments. This is a good deal. Then you wind up in the denial zone. It's the worst place to be. And then worse than that, 
you might wind up in the Hail Mary zone. That's when they call you when the house is getting ready to be sold in a day or two, and they expect you to miraculously close on it and make everything work. So if you catch them in the beginning, you have a lot more options. You can actually give them money. You can get the house sold. You got a couple months to sell it. It's like the perfect scenario. And you want to buy it in that action zone between the first month and a maximum the fourth month. After that, it's usually a complete disaster. Nobody wants to do a deal in the middle because they think they've got it all figured out. That's where everyone procrastinates. And then they'll call you about 10 days before the sale. They're like, oh, hey, Alex, remember you called me? I'm ready to move that deal. I'm like, dude, that was 10 months ago. You haven't made <laughs> one payment. The loan's going to be, there's never, a, he goes, I'll take your 10,000. I go, I don't think there's 10,000 left in it anymore. <laughs> and then like, you got to reclose them. It's like, it's just toward, I 95% of the people when they call and they have an auction date don't work out. Why? Because now they're panicked and they're freaked out. And usually they've, they beat the house to hell. They haven't made any payments. The, the, the loan's out of control and they usually owe more than the house is worth. And that was their last ditch finance effort. So catch them in the very beginning because that's the best part to cut. And then if you can catch someone before they actually, the, they file the lawsuit for the foreclosure, the pre foreclosure, it's even better. And you know, how do you find those people? You just got to hunt. That's it. So just don't wait too late. And by the way, you got to figure out how to get that information from your local courthouse anyways. Okay. All it's right. good to have. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, and then I, I just have one more question. So um, I'm, this is my first month in. So January was when I started. Uh, so I haven't got any deals yet. I have maybe like a few follow-ups. I'm still, you know, working at it, you know, grinding every day. Um, okay. I know you've said that direct mail is something that should be done after you get your first couple of deals. Um, I'm not sure because because I do have like I'm willing to put uh, to invest money in it um, if it works uh, just to have some type of inbound marketing, because I, I think as of now, uh, I can't really get into SMS and scale it because I needed to have like a EIN number, which I don't have set up yet because I don't have a business. Yeah. So um, just. Go over to mailingmastery.com and spend some time in there. It's the yeah. best course on direct mail, paid or free. And I give a summary of my 21 years experience of exactly how to do it step by step, what to do, how to prioritize it, and understand why. If you want to take this method, this is the best way to do it. So just check that out. And if you want to come back on the live, I'll be happy to answer any questions. I love direct mail, but it's not for everyone. Oh, yeah, I, and I don't recommend it as a starting thing. Okay, yeah, I did go through it. Uh, yeah, it's a pretty good course. I, I agree with you. I just haven't uh, haven't tried uh, you know ordering anything yet because you you recommended that you know maybe you should get your first few deals before you you start it. I well, just, it, uh, it's it's up to you, guys. I I like I got my I did three deals before I did direct mail, and then I tried uh -huh. it. And to be honest, with you, I tried it out of a whim. Like I just like what do I got to lose? I I had plenty to lose. It just worked out for me. And then I never stopped doing it. So once you understand the mechanics and how you make money on it, you'll never stop doing it if you do it. I get it a lot. The only people who say direct mail doesn't work are the ones that don't understand it. Yeah. Like, listen, wholesaling is not the only industry use direct mail. A lot of industries use it. Why do you think, I know Bed Bath & Beyond is a bad one, but why do you think Domino's and Little Caesar Pizza constantly send you those coupons in the mail? Because you all fall for it. And like, it's good business. And you get a little bit of discount. They get a new customer and hopefully you like their service and their pizza so much you order back more. And it's the same thing. You just got to keep finding the right lists. And so once you understand the list, the direct mail part is super, super simple. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. Here's the reality yeah, is now, most people don't have the confidence to do direct mail. And that's why I came up with that mailing mastery. If you understand it, you understand it takes three months to, to figure out if it's effective. Most people look yeah. at direct mail and within 10 days, they want to make a final decision on it. It's terrible. You can't do it that way. You're not looking yeah. at the product correctly. So most people freak out when they have to spend money on direct mail. And I'm here to tell you, I freak out if I don't pay for my direct mail every month because I know I get a five times return on my money. So imagine if you... If you invested three grand and you could turn that into 15 grand, you would be bugging, you know, yourself to invest that 3000 every month. I already yeah. know it's like, dude, it's like clockwork. It's like, honestly, and it's never worked out perfectly, 
But for the most part, five-time return with a lot of experience. If you're brand new to it, you should get a three times return. If not, yeah. you didn't give enough time or you didn't follow the plan, either or. And so if you understand that going into it, it's easy. I just I just recently helped someone who was doing very well, like a lot, like some of the people, and he did like his first 10 deals. Go, hey, I want to try direct mail. I'm like, listen, you just need confidence in it. And I went a little above and beyond for this person, but I go, hey, make this investment. Now he's making so much money off direct mail. He's like, I can't believe I didn't do this before. I'm like, and he was freaking out over like a $1,500 investment. <laughs> and then the guy you saw last Friday, he yeah, used yeah. ROS postcard and he made 17 grand. He never even really did a deal before. I'm just telling you guys, it works, but you have to be extremely consistent and very disciplined and you have to understand the plan. So it's just like Monopoly. If you have to... If you want to win, you've got to read every rule to the game. Nobody ever reads the rules to Monopoly. If you read the entire rules of Monopoly, you'd be in shock. Like you can borrow money. You can do all sorts of things. You don't have to just, the, the money on the board is how retail spenders think. If you're a wholesaler, eventually you look like that money on the board is just what you can see. There's billions, if not trillions of dollars behind that to fund any deal that makes sense. And once you open yourself up to it, you can like play the game a lot better. So I, dude, I was horrified when I first direct mail, like I was like chattering my teeth, but honestly, I've made some of my biggest profits off direct mail and I still love it. So five times return once you get very seasoned at it. And in the beginning, if you play by the rules and you do exactly what I just said, three month commitment and you, you read the rules and you understand it three times is going to be your average return on it. So a thousand dollars, Turn to three thousand. And remember, you can't outspend yourself when it comes to um, direct mail. Meaning, if you say you spend five thousand, go well. If I spend ten thousand, it's going to double. No, no, no. It doesn't work that way. Unfortunately, I've tested that theory out. It doesn't work that way. You'll just spend your money faster, and you can't process the leads. So, do yeah. do the mailing faster. I'm telling you, you you just do it, and then uh, the connection we give you with open letter marketing, they'll walk you through everything and help you out on top of it. So. Remember, I helped them design that whole system. That system was designed for my company specifically. I don't want to be a printer. I have no interest in it. So I think I remember I, you saying that you, you used to do it all yourself. You had like a room did, for it. And it was like I had yeah. a dedicated room in my house. I, my wife almost killed me over it. Like we ruined <laughs> the room. Ink machines were running. Like these machines are expensive. They're terrible. Like imagine yeah. getting I a think jam. You said on one time a it thing. jammed. Yeah. So yeah. I you have a roll of stamps. And each roll is like uh, $2,500 in stamps. And then it sticks yeah. a stamp on the same envelope like 3,000 times. You're out $2,500. <laughs> That's The learning curve is terrible. It's like, so why? Listen, guys, don't ever do it. If you're going to do like little probate letters and stuff like that, that's fine. But if you're going to do anything over 500 pieces, outsource it. It's significantly cheaper and you'll save yourself a lot of aggravation. I'm telling you. So... <laughs> Yeah, you got I mean, it, man. I'm just telling you, man. I love direct mail, but like it's it's not a requirement with me. Like, I don't if you don't take my direct mail course, you you know, I can't help you out. I'm just like the people that do it stick with it and they learn it. And it's it's a learning curve like anything else. So if you picked up something new, if say you wanted to pay an instrument, it's a little bit of a painful learning curve. You just gotta pay someone to do it. So that's the whole por purpose of mailing mastery. I would watch it like a second time. And if you understand the mechanics. I just saved you 20 years of like crap. I'm telling you, most people quit direct mail because they don't understand. It. I understand the yeah. game. I've gotten my butt kicked in it. I've done very well. I've done very bad. And so like I take the good and the bad and I go, hey, here's how you do it. This is how I want you to do it. So make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I, right now I'm just doing a, a reverse driving for dollars because that's a form of inbound marketing. Then, you know, it's uh -huh. free for now. But yeah. I just want to see if I can test out my uh, the list that I'm using to see if it's an effective uh, list for you know inbound marketing. So I, that's the thing that I'm just thinking about right now is trying to find the best list to, to market to for direct mail. So that's uh -huh. the thing that I'm stuck on. Okay. Well, you yeah, got it, bud. It. Let me know how it works out. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Rachel. I'll see you later. Okay, guys. So if uh, you're new to this channel, do me a favor. Go over to freewholesaling.com. We teach you how to get your first deal. And up to your first hundred grand. If you guys want to do a deal with us, check us out on sellmypaper.com where you can JV and earn 50% of the money. And guys, as usual, please make sure you subscribe to this channel. I release 
content on this channel. I don't release on any other channel. And make sure you check out my son's channel, Zach Ginn. I appreciate you guys. Go over to freewholesaling.com. Get in the business, guys, and just get started. Start talking to people and make sure you practice what you preach. And we'll see you guys tomorrow at 1 o'clock Eastern time. I appreciate you guys.